Now that the basic scientific principles have been discussed, it is time to explore the training guidelines for muscular endurance, hypertrophy and strength. More often than not, people just want to know what are the magic number of reps that are needed in order to get the results that they are after. But remember, muscles do not know numbers. They just know how hard they are working. So whilst the rep ranges are great to know, it is the manipulation of intensity and volume that determines the outcome. Before we go into the specifics of the guidelines, let's recap on the variables that you need to choose before writing an effective program. Number one. Pick the training outcome that is appropriate to that person's goal. For example, do they want to get stronger or bigger or fitter? Or do they want all three? Number two, you need to decide on the exercises that are going to be appropriate for the client's wants and needs. This means taking into consideration their training age and any weaknesses as identified in their fitness testing. The exercises selected must also contribute to a balanced program. Three, Choose the appropriate number of sets, reps, and tempo. Four, choose the appropriate amount of load to be used. For example, is it going to be light, moderate, or heavy? Or alternatively, you can use a percentage of their 1RM. And five, identify how much rest between sets is required. So far, the training variables that we have been focusing on have been volume and intensity. Now we are going to explore exercise selection and exercise ordering. Exercise selection and ordering are vital in ensuring that the client gets results, but also does it in a safe manner. Most traditional programs contain too many exercises and are often prescribed in an illogical order. Firstly, compound or multi-joint exercises should form the backbone of your program. Compound exercises are considered to be appropriate for all people, regardless of their skill level. Compound exercises have more bang for their buck, meaning that the client will benefit greatly from having them in their program due to a multitude of reasons. One of the biggest benefits of performing compound exercises is that the movement patterns are more functional. They mimic the patterns that are performed in everyday life. Movements such as squat, lunge, push, pull, rotation are integral to the quality of our overall movement. Due to the fact that many joints are being used in compound exercises, which indicates many muscles are working, heavier loads can be moved. The benefit of this being that there is a greater training stimulus, an increase in neural activation, a high hormonal response, an increase in calories burnt, and the smaller muscles are also trained simultaneously. All of this meaning that the client could get results faster and therefore bang for their buck. I'm sure the question running through your head right now though is, what about the role of isolated exercises? Well, there is a definite time and place for the use of isolated exercises. And they are normally used in a rehabilitation setting, when trying to retrain movement patterns, in postural correction, and when strengthening weak links in a movement. To further maximize your client's results, you must know how to order your exercises correctly. These rules must be followed any time you write a program. Large muscle groups must be trained before small muscle groups or compound exercises before isolated exercises. The reason behind this is twofold. Firstly, most of the exercises used for training the large muscle groups tend to be the most complicated and require the most amount of load. So it makes sense to train these first when they are at their freshest. Smaller muscles already tend to be the weak link in any compound movements. So training the smaller muscles before the larger ones mean that they will become fatigued and further become more of a weak link. The smaller muscles then will end up being the limiting factor in the compound movement rather than the larger ones. This also relates to ensuring that the prime mover is always trained before the assistant mover. It is also important to consider muscle mass. Train the exercises that require the largest muscle mass first. For example, a lunge is more complex than a squat. However, a squat requires more muscle mass, therefore it must be trained first. Additionally, this means that bilateral exercises will precede unilateral exercises. More complex exercises must be done before less complex ones, as these ones are more neurologically demanding and require a greater degree of stability, energy and concentration. So for example, a chin up should be performed before a lat pull down or a squat before a leg press. 
Lastly, it is necessary to ensure that the program is balanced, and this being the balance between agonist and antagonistic muscle groups. In the body, there are a couple of major groups of agonist antagonistic groups, for example, the quadriceps and the hamstrings, the chest and the back, and the biceps and the triceps. It is important to make sure that these are trained evenly. For example, if there is a horizontal push pattern in the program, such as a chest press, then there must be a horizontal pull exercise, such as a seated row, to ensure that it is balanced. If a program leans heavily towards a particular muscle group, for example, a program that contains lots of chest push type exercises with no pull or back exercise, then it is possible to cause postural changes and predispose the client to injury.